Hello, my name is Bob Barker, and I'm one of the partners at Barker Gilmore. Thanks for joining today's GC Advantage webinar. For those not familiar with Barker Gilmore, we're passionate about helping companies uh, develop, uh, lead, and optimize their legal and compliance teams. And we're really recognized for, for you know, quality, diversity, and helping our clients with long-term success. Today's topic is uh, critical for those who are climbing the corporate ladder. Uh, it's how to lead people who have once been your peers. Uh, we also have upcoming webinars that you'll find on our website. Uh, for, for example, the next webinar coming up the next month is gonna be charting a strategic course for your legal department. We also have a library of previously recorded uh, on-demand webinars uh, that are available. Uh, today's presentation is being recorded and will be added to the library in about three weeks. Uh, an email will be sent to everyone who is attended today and, and registered. Um, so you will get those materials, um, you know, you'll be notified as soon as those materials are available. Uh, we'll also be sending out a copy of the presentation um, at, at the conclusion of, of today's event to, to again, those people who are, are registered. Uh, during the session today, we encourage you to submit questions. Um, at the bottom of the Zoom application, you'll see a Q&A button. So feel free to um, submit those questions. And there's also the opportunity to um, give a thumbs up if there's a question that uh, somebody else has posted that you also have the same uh, question and, and they'll just raise that in the, the, the list so we know that that's a, a very important question. And it will be, uh, we may answer some of the questions during the course of the event um, and some that we'll, we'll hold to the, the end uh, of, of the session and uh, answer at, at the end of the time. And we, we'll do our best to, to answer as many of those questions today as possible. Um, with that is kind of the, some of the uh, housekeeping. I would like to turn it over to Marla Persky. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Bob, thanks for setting us on this path. I'm very happy to be with you all today. My name is Marla Persky. I have been a lawyer for well over 30 years, but the last eight of which I'm a happily retired lawyer. And what I do instead is I work with Barker Gilmore and others to, uh, as an executive coach for sitting general counsel, and I also serve on corporate boards. Uh, I've been in the pharmaceutical industry for the vast majority of my career, and it was as general counsel and uh, Deputy General Counsel at Baxter International that I had the great pleasure of meeting Tim Murphy. Tim and I worked together for many, many years. And as is true with many of the folks that I've worked with, went on, left Baxter and became General Counsel of their own places. Tim uh, was gracious enough to join me today for us to talk about the challenges that people face in being elevated to either a, a general counsel, a deputy general counsel, a manager of those people who you used to be peers with in a department. And that has its own unique challenges. Tim, before we get into the bulk of everything, how about introducing yourself to our audience? I will do that. Thanks, Marla. And I had the privilege not only of meeting you at Baxter, but also being hired by you and supervised by you. So uh, Marla and I go back a long ways. I've got 35 years of practicing law. I started out four years of that in, in big law and the last 31 years have been in-house. So uh, I've had the experience myself of of uh, having former peers report to me. And of course, when you've been in house for a long time, you see a lot of it happening, both to my peers, uh, other people in the, in the entity. So this is gonna be a great topic. I'm looking forward to speaking with you, Marla. Thanks, Tim. And what, tell people a little bit about Hollister. Sure, so Hollister Incorporated is a large private 
a company in, that internationally markets, manufactures, and sells medical devices. Uh, we're located in a northern Chicago suburb, and our company just celebrated its 100th year anniversary. Oh, yeah. Nice. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. So let's jump into the topic. So supervising former peers can be extremely challenging, and it's a it's an adjustment for everybody, you in your new role, but also those who are used to being your buddy and your pal and would gossip with you and suddenly now you're their boss. So what we are going to do today is that Tim and I are going to share uh, our personal experiences, what worked well, what we learned from the School of Hard Knocks in assuming leadership of people who were your peers and maybe doing some comparing and contrasting. Because in addition to us both having been promoted and therefore being the boss of peers, we also joined new companies where we came in as the boss. And so there's a compare and contrast as to particularly in the very beginning, how, what you do and how you conduct yourself. Um, it's just very different being hired in as the boss because that's how everybody's going to know you from day one versus suddenly having a role that you may have even been vying with others for to get. So perhaps we can go to the next slide. Good. So on, on this slide, what Marla and I did was we put together our, uh, it, it will sound odd, Marla, but between or with the two of us, it's over 50 years of experience. And, and Marla said it, what, what we learn are the good practices that we've engaged in, but also we've learned from the mistakes that we've made. So this slide sets forth our agenda for most of our discussion today. And these are the, the tips or the approaches to make if you find yourself in the position of now supervising those who used to be your peers. Uh, the first two to me, they may seem at odds, but they just require good balance. The first one of course is to tread lightly when you first start out. And the second thing though, is to make sure that you establish your authority. The third tip is to distance yourself from your former peers. The fourth one is to deal with uh, those who are going to be disappointed. And the next one is to make use of your advantages. As Marla said, it's different when you start at a new company and become the leader versus being promoted to become a leader. And then the last point, of course, is that if you're working in-house, in all likelihood, uh, that's not your business. It's not law. So you're going to have other teammates to think about too. So we'll go through each of these tips in a little bit more detail in uh, the following slides. And we encourage you to type your questions in the Q&A as we go along. I'll be scanning for questions. So treading lightly at first, as with any change, people need a period of adjustment. You need a period of adjusting in your new role and your team needs to adjust to you as a leader. And the best way that I think Tim and I agree on to do this is to establish your role as a leader, but a very honest and open approach and recognize verbally to everybody that you know it's going to require some adjustment on their part. When you are new to a company, you're hired in, let's say, as general counsel, you need to take a little time to survey the scene to figure out what, if any, changes need to be made, is the talent aligned with the needs, all of that. So you're learning on the job. So it's rare that you would come in and make an immediate change. When you've been promoted from inside, you have probably years of experience, what is working, what isn't working, who, who's a valuable employee, who's less valuable. Oh, if only we could make these changes. Those were probably discussions you were having with people who you are now their boss of. And 
the mis I think a mistake is to make changes immediately. It's one thing to have in mind what you would change if you had the job. It's the other making the changes all at one time because you can't make the change alone, right? You need to have your team on board with you. And if they're not used to being your team, you may not get the support that you need in order to make the change. So take a little time to step back and get people used to the new state of play. Open door policy, of course, during COVID, that becomes a little more complicated, but open door policy is really critical to make sure that people can come in and approach and ask questions. Change is scary and it takes a while for people to adjust. And I think what's critical, even though you know these people because you've worked with them, is to meet with them one-on-one -on -one almost immediately so that they know where they stand with you. What have you got to add to this, Tim? I would say the, that whether you are new to an entity or whether you are a new leader in an entity, one of the most important things you can do is listen with your ears and not your mouth or don't take actions. So listening with the intent to be persuaded by others that's key because you'll definitely have a perspective. You've been in the entity, you know the people, you'll have a perspective, but it can be a little bit of a perspective in isolation too. So make sure uh, to listen carefully. And the second thing that I agree wholeheartedly with you on Marla is you have to enable that adjustment period. You do that by listening. You do that by being patient. And uh, it just, at, at, some t at some point, it does become a thing that you do at first. So maybe we move to the next slide, which is um, establishing your authority because that follows quickly. Right, so one of the things that I did when I took over leadership at, at Baxter where Tim and I worked together. And even when I went to my next company, which was Behringer, and I was hired in as a brand new person to the company, is I did what was called a new leader assimilation, which is, I'll explain the process, but I think is a very good way of helping set expectations and establishing a communication pattern so that your team knows what to expect of you. They know that they can approach you and give you feedback about their expectations. And so what the new leader assimilation is, is I recommend that it's facilitated by somebody else, either somebody in human resources, you can hire consultants on the outside to come in and do it. And what they do is they meet with your team, either one-on-one -on -one or in a group without you to talk through what they think their expectations of you are. What did the, let's pretend that you become general counsel, what did the former general counsel do that they really liked they want you to keep doing? What did the former general counsel do that they hated that they would love you not to do? If there was you know, a fairy godmother and they could instruct you or have you do anything, what would that be to help them as individuals and them as a team thrive? And this really is far more about expectations of the leadership team of the department of you as leader of the department, not individually, what does this mean for my personal career? Because those are one-on-one -on -one discussions that you're gonna have with each one of the people. This is really to help establish a team dynamic and a team esprit de corps in a newly constituted team. Now, obviously, the facilitator takes the information, conglomerates it, and protects the anonymity of the commenters, then talks with you about what he or she has heard, lets you prepare for your um, meeting then with your team to go over what you've heard and what your reaction's going to be. 
in, in the team meeting where all of your team and you and the facilitator are together, the facilitator will go through what the facilitator heard and present it to you for your reaction. And then at the end, you set your expectations so that everybody can hear them at the same time and talk with, you know, ask questions. It's, a, it's level setting. It's creating the foundation for how you are going to govern your team, how you're going to communicate with your team, how you expect your team to communicate with you and with one another. And it gets people engaged and gives them the opportunity to hear from one another what, what they want as a team. So yeah, I Tim, think that, have you done yeah. something similar? I, you described the process very, very well, and and it works. That's the other thing too, is that it works. And I have expanded on this type of practice. I actually do something similar to this once a year, even after I've been in an entity for a long time, because if you can have anonymity protected by having somebody facilitated, as you suggest, and then have that room, the rule in that room is that nothing comes out of that room until the group agrees as to what the leader is told. So that can help to be a check-in at least once a year. I do it once a year just to, to see what further changes either I need to make or issues that I need to address because what's being requested or mentioned may be contrary to my expectations. So it's a practice you don't have to stop doing as soon as you become a leader. And I think that is actually a best demonstrated practice, Tim, that you continue to use the process as you go along because there's always new members that come into a team, dynamics change, and it's just a very good practice. One of, so I've had people who were my peers become my boss in the past and it's, it's disruptive, it's unsettling. And I've seen people do it with grace and I've seen people do it with a hammer, i.e., you know, I'm in charge now, you know, I'm thinking about Khrushchev taking off his shoe and banging it on the table when he was visiting the White House. That's not probably the most effective way. Uh, the reality is whether people agree with the decision to have had you become the boss or not, you are the boss. They have to realize that somebody had great confidence in you and that's why you got the job and you don't have to establish your authority by force. It's by action, communication, showing that you are committed to the team and the team dynamics and to share information. I, I'd say to share information on a nice to know not a need to know because communication, information is power. And lawyers often know oh, if only, only people who need to know should know this stuff. And so we keep secrets, stuff that has no confidential basis to it that requires being kept secret. Um, one of the people who became my boss at one point would pull the team together after a, um, an executive committee meeting and after board meetings and talk to us about what happened in those meetings. We weren't there, he was there, but he shared that information. And I know he didn't tell us absolutely everything that everybody said, but it made us feel like he trusted us. He was sharing information we would have no other conduit of getting. And sometimes you never know how a piece of information will actually help you. And so it's, it's the open flow, it's the open door, it's the open flow, and just to tell people things so that they feel like you trust them and that they're part of the team. What can you add here, Tim? Well, I think maybe two things. The first one on the sharing of information, you said it very well, and in my words, don't breach confidentiality. If information is intended to be held in confidence, keep it there. But there's a lot that you can provide, and it makes people feel as if they are part of the team, they're trusted. 
one of the benefits that you as a supervisor get and the company gets is the extra discretionary effort that people will give the entity when they feel like they are in fact a part of the team. So there's a huge benefit to both how your team performs as well as to how the overall company performs by trying to engage in this type of behavior, good behavior. And the second thing I wanted to add, Marla, is that uh, I think we've all seen bad examples of power play where somebody established my authority and come in with a fist or something. It's the total wrong way to go about it. And uh, I'll share an experience that I had with a multifunctional team that I was on where we got a leader that was new to the business and told his multifunctional, multi-business team that now that he was boss, he set the expectations for us. Okay, good so far. And that if we didn't meet those expectations, it was not going to be his neck on the line. It would be ours. That was the wrong way to go about <laughs> endearing a team to one's new leader. So establish your authority, use good skills when you do it. You do have to establish your authority, but if you're a dictator, you know, the, that management style has been out for a long time. Right. And one, th one thing that, at least in my experience, I found is that establishing my authority happens faster when I just don't think about it in a group setting, but on a one-on-one -on -one setting. So if you're meeting with people individually, you don't have to order, you can ask questions, you can ask for opinions, you can disagree respectfully. <clears throat> and I think doing that in one-on-one -on -one discussions is another, is a very, very effective way of letting people know that, yeah, you are the boss, but you are a boss who wants input and is not going to make decisions unilaterally. Ultimately, Again, I don't know what I'm thinking about with the White House. I guess it was the um, election yesterday that Harry Truman had the buck stops here at, on his desk as the, as the leader of a group, as the boss of people. You have to eventually make decisions. Otherwise, you're not a very good boss. Not everything can be done by committee, but you don't have to make it in a vacuum. You should never make it in a vacuum. And giving credit where credit's due is a lot easier when you've had the one-on-one -on -one discussions and you get the input from other people. So maybe even though, we're, if we go to the next slide, please, even though you want to you want to be approachable, you want to be friendly, you want to um, have an open line of communication there's a tightrope here. Maybe, Tim, you want to talk about the tightrope. Yeah, this one's a tough one because, uh, and I love the quote, it's lonely at the top, which is, is so true. So uh, distancing yourself, it doesn't mean all of a sudden you stop talking to all your friends. You, that's not what this means. This means, though, starting to put some distance in the relationship because you have the authority to fire somebody. You have the authority to promote somebody. So things have changed for sure. It needs to be a professional relationship. And so when I think of some things that I did wrong the first time I got promoted to be responsible for supervising my peers is that I had some really trusted confidants in my peer group, people that had given me good counsel in the past. I relied on them. We had worked through issues together, et cetera. So I continued to rely on, on my trusted advisors. And what I failed to do is to give the whole team a chance to be my trusted advisor. So I learned from that experience, but um, just think of that, that things have changed. Hopefully you distanced, hopefully all along you've distanced yourself from the gossip mill. So hopefully you are not a, a company gossip, but certainly if you have engaged in gossiping or if you go below the line every now and then, as a leader, it's time for that type of behavior to stop. So uh, think of what your role is, that you're a supervisor of people. You're also a promoter of company initiatives, of, 
of helping to create and sustain the company culture. So your role is just, is a, is a whole lot different now. And appearances count here. If people perceive favoritism, if they see inconsistencies in what you do, people will see that and start to lose confidence in you as a leader. So just think about appearances. Whose offices are you stopping in? Who are you talking to in the hallway? And uh, who do you arrive in a meeting with? Who do you sit by? Who do you leave with? Who do you go on vacation with? I, I had a new CEO who continued to go on family vacations with two former peers. And, you know, don't think that when somebody sees a picture of somebody out on a safari in Africa, that that word doesn't go around too. So just think about appearances. They really do count in this space. So before we go on, Tim, there's a couple of questions that came in. First is hearkening back to the new leader assimilation. And in the best of all worlds, this is something that you want to do within the first four to six weeks of you taking on your job. However, the question is, what if the new leader assimilation is occurring late, let's say after only six months post-promotion, when people have already been overwhelmed with feelings of anger and frustration about the choice that was made? And I think it's never too late for a new leader assimilation to occur. As you heard, what Tim had said is that he does stuff like this continuously. It's not called a new leader assimilation anymore, but I would still hold it after six months and say, all right, we've had about six months to get used to one another. Some things have gone really well, and you can use that opportunity to shout out members of your team who have accomplished good things, not just as individuals, but as team members, some things could have gone better. I think this is a really great time now that we've had experience working together with me as your leader for us to make sure that we are all operating on the same level. We all are singing on the same, from the same page of music. Let's clearly articulate what you expect from me, what I've been delivering that you're really happy I'm delivering and you want me to keep doing, what you wish I would stop doing or start doing. And I will again articulate with everybody hearing at the same time, what I expect from you as a team. So yes, there will be hard feelings. The hard feelings are things that you need to deal with on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but it's not too late to do this level setting and this open communication. And if nothing else, what it does do is facilitate the other members of the team, again, with a facilitator, to hear one another what their thinking and feeling is, but not in a gossipy way. Yeah, those are good points. The, the thing to keep in mind or to try to determine is what are people upset with? And so if there are things that if people are disgruntled, I didn't get the job and, and Susie or John are no good for it, they shouldn't have it either. Okay, that we deal with in a different way. And I think we'll talk about that in a little bit. But if there are things that you have truly done wrong, I mean, being vulnerable is one of the strongest attributes of a good leader and admitting one's mistakes. So if it's six months, you, you haven't quite come in to the new role quite as well as you should have, own up to it. People are going to see it. Everybody knows it. So own up to it and say, I'm changing. I'm going to listen more. I'm going to consult more, whatever it is, uh, indicate that, that you realize things did not go the way you would have liked them to have that you've committed to change. And then of course, you better follow up with the change. Yeah, walk the talk as they say. So as we're talking about talking and walking and what do you do with your team members who are themselves are leaders? Question is, is it fair to ask that they operate on a nice to know rather than a need to know basis, as opposed to just you as the leader operating on that basis? The concern is how do you do that without you have 
without having people feel like their sphere of influence is being diminished or that you as the leader are intruding on what used to be their responsibility when you were their peer. Do you have any thoughts on that, Tim? Yeah, that's actually a brilliant question and I'm gonna answer it maybe indirectly, but the first thing I'd say is that whenever you become a leader, and you have new people, whether they're your former peers or anybody else, always think about, about preserving their credibility, their authority, et cetera. So no, you know, the salespeople will tell you no sale is made by talking a competitor down. You, you, you know, you make a sale by talking your own stuff up. Well, when you become a leader, be mindful of that because the people who you need to preserve are the people that report to you. So you, you be mindful of them, how, how things that you might do that might detract from their authority, their credibility, et cetera. Um, the, the second part that I would say on this is that um, uh you can, and I, maybe I don't quite understand the question because it's certainly your subordinates can share on a nice to know basis too. This area just takes being mindful of keeping confidences, keeping information that should be confidential as confidential, but it's a broader practice that can be followed by anybody in the entity, generally speaking. So one way that I think helps people realize that the sharing in a nice to know way is not diminishing their own um, acreage of land, if you will, is that in the team meetings that you're going to have with your direct reports periodically, and you're sharing information on a nice to know, and I'm going to harken back to our old Baxter days, Tim, where I'm sharing information on a nice to know, and then I say, Tim, so what can you share with the team? If there are things that you're not sharing with the team that I know about, because you and I have talked individually one-on-one -on -one, that I think the team would benefit knowing from, I'll just say, Tim, you told me the other day X, maybe you wanna share that as well too. And then after you share whatever you share, I say, and, and Tim, Tim, thanks for sharing that. You know, Mary, I think, you may want to talk to Tim about this because of a similar thing. And so you as the leader start showing how Tim has his sphere of influence and authority and responsibility, but that by sharing the information, he's helping his peer, his peers step up their practice and their knowledge. And again, you don't know what you don't know. So that if Tim is sharing something about a client and I've done some work with that client, he may be giving me important insight that it might take a lot longer for me to get on my own. So I think it's the way you, it's not, you don't have any of your own influence. It's like, let me hand you the mic, Tim. And now it's your turn to sing for a little while. So I, I, I think there's, it's not that hard to make people feel comfortable sharing and questioning is, is a very important and powerful tool. Another question at, was about how often do you meet with people one-on-one? -on -one? I, I don't know that there's a one size fits all. Tim, what, what do you do? It depends, the typical lawyer answer, right? It depends upon what's going on. At a minimum, I have and always have had meetings uh, twice a week, or I'm sorry, twice uh, a month on the calendar to force the interaction. But then it's those one-offs, it's Marla talked about the open door policy, it's all those more urgent things. When you have discussions, you may meet with somebody five times a day, depending upon what's going on, what you've got them doing, the support that they need, any of the hurdles or struggles that they may have. So I think the answer really is it truly depends. I just make sure I've got things on the calendar to make sure that we have meeting time in the event it's somebody that's not going to be coming to me informally quite so much. Well, I completely agree. I, I am an animal of my calendar. So I make sure that all of my direct reports are meeting with me. It was every other week, although 
a couple of them I would meet with every single week, either because the relationship was a little troubled or their sphere of responsibility was such that it enough was happening that we needed to make sure we were touching base on a very regular basis. Um, but definitely at least at least twice a month because too much happens not to be with them. And also I always believed that it was my responsibility for setting the agenda, not the topics. They got to set the topics. I would set the agenda. So we get, begin by me giving them an update on something I might know about their sphere of influence that I'm not going to share in the big group because that's where the confidentiality comes in. But I share it with them up front. Then I ask them to tell me what they think I should be knowing about and then try to leave time. This doesn't happen at each meeting, but at least once a month just to talk them as a professional, them personally, how things are going. You know, are there any CLEs they want to attend? Is there, have they heard about anything that concerns them that they want to talk about? So again, it's not necessarily every single meeting, but waiting once a year to ask somebody if they're happy and ask what they want in their career is a horrible missed opportunity to be a continual conversation. Um, there's a really good question here, Tim. I'm dying to hear what you have to say about this. And is, can you talk a little bit about leading people who used to be your managers? So that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, this one is difficult. Uh, and the, the first thing to do I think is to have that one-on-one -on -one with that person and call it out, right? This one, you don't even want to wait for because this one's a tricky one. And so uh, have, have, so if your, your manager jumps over you, so now you are that manager that jumped, right? I think you have to go to your old boss, have a very, very frank discussion. And then a lot of the same things follow that that we either did talk about earlier that we will talk about and the the main thing to remember is that and this is in whatever relationship we don't control how the other person responds in our relationship we can try to influence it but in the end we can't control it so a lot of the future interactions after that first one of of calling it out this is what's happened and and our relationship will change, here are my expectations. After you do all that, a lot of it, I think, depends upon how the other person responds. And I think acknowledging, you know, when you were my boss, Tim, you did these three things that I really, really liked. And I'm stealing that, those practices from you because they were so very effective. So you acknowledge the fact that they actually did their job as your supervisor because they helped set you up for success. Just so happened the success leapfrogged them, but they did their job. They helped you thrive. And it's, it's hard. It's, and you have to realize that you won't keep everybody, right? I mean, if some people will leave the company and then it's your responsibility for helping them leave with dignity, but um, it, it, it's a tough situation that, you know, now that you're the boss of somebody who used to be your supervisor, but they did good things. Otherwise it wouldn't have happened. They taught you good things. They added to your success. And I think acknowledging that at the very beginning is a good way to get the relationship off on as, as a strong a footing as it possibly can be. Yeah, and the more that we can make any human relationship about the other person and not yourself, that's always just a good EQ thing to try to practice. And it, it might be expressing gratitude for what they have done for you in the past, because presumably they had a hand in getting you to where you are now. So just 
practicing all the good EQ things that are, are the topics of many webinars, that those are things to keep in mind too. There's another question about if during the assimilation period, i.e. the early stages of your new role, a direct report violates company policy and has to be reprimanded. It's clear that they haven't respected your authority. How do you recover and establish authority without building future resentment? I'm gonna do the chicken's way out. I'm gonna kick that to you, Tim, first <laughs> to try to take on. Uh, well, the question presumed that somebody had bad intent. That may or may not be the case. So I think the first thing to do is to keep an open mind and have an honest discussion with what happened. Because it, it's easy for us to think that we know what the intent was or to read somebody's mind, but we'll be wrong a lot. So keep an open mind um, and, and have a very frank discussion. And then I think it depends is the answer once again. So if there was bad intent, well, then you have a decision as to what does that mean for going forward? Is this behavior that can be coached and corrected or is this just insubordination that has to be dealt with in a very hard way? So uh, it's a great question, but there's so much that depends upon the circumstances. It's hard to give just one definitive answer to. Keep an open mind, deal with directly and deal with appropriately. All right, and bad, bad behavior needs to be dealt with on a one-on-one -on -one basis, never in a group setting. And I think it's, Tim was spot on when he said, you need to get to the heart of why this happened. You know, people make mistakes. They violate rules either out of ignorance or, or just um, carelessness. That's not necessarily bad intent. If there's a bad intent, then you need to go at it directly. And, and this goes back to establishing authority. This might be with um, a kid glove over a steel fish, where you say, you know, we're not going to be able to mutually thrive if this is, if this is the approach you're going to take. So let's make it really clear. This is my expectations. When you do X, you are not fulfilling the expectation. When you do Y, you're violating company policy. I'm going to treat this as a, a lapse in judgment, and we're going to try to reset and, and move forward. But I got to tell you, Tim, if this happens again, the discussion we're having is with human resources in the room and you're going to be on a performance improvement plan because this can't be tolerated. And so you yeah. just make it, I mean, people deserve a second chance. Of course, it depends upon what the lying, cheating, stealing, that's not a second chance, right? So <laughs> it's, it's, as you said, it is situational. Yeah, and a lot of this Q&A it's great questions, but for me, it, it highlights the need to find a good mentor, a good coach, because all of these circumstances are so fact dependent and how I might approach something is different from how Marla might approach it. And so you want, you want your trusted advisors, preferably outside of the entity, who you can run these types of situations by and say, here's what's going on. What do you think? So let's go on to, I know there are more questions, but I think we'll get to them if we go on to the next slide, please. And this gets to dealing with disappointed competitors. Um, in the end, the best things for, for everybody may be that your competitor, the disappointed competitor, leaves the organization for another opportunity. And that gets back to something that I had said earlier, that you want to treat everybody with dignity. So if somebody's going to leave, they leave with their head up and not with their tail between their legs. But you shouldn't presume that your competitor needs to leave or wants to leave. That's kind of in the competitor's you know, your disappointed competitors' hands, it's not in your hands. What is in your hands is making it comfortable for them to stay, acknowledging their value, giving them the opportunity to take on more responsibility or increase their sphere of influence. 
Um, they didn't get the job, but that doesn't mean there's not an other job that may not come up in the not too distant future that they are good for. To be seen as a supporter, both in action and in words of your disappointed competitor. I mean, so the best you can do is, you know, if Tim gets the job over me and Tim makes me feel welcome, wanted, valued, and growing still in the job, maybe I don't think the grass is greener someplace else. Maybe I realize that this, this is still a good company with really great people, and I like Tim, and maybe I can even learn something from him, but he's going to let me spread my wings and fly. That's the best way to keep a disappointed competitor. I don't know if you've had anything that you've done that you found particularly effective in dealing with the disappointed competitor, Tim. I think the main thing is people are going to be disappointed if they don't get the job. So people will be disappointed, period. If they threw their, their hat in the ring, uh, they'll be disappointed. So the best thing that I have found is to help enable them to become a supportive person. They will be disappointed. I can't do a whole lot about that, but I can, I can help them be somebody who's going to be supportive of me and supportive of the team. And then Marla, as you suggest, if at some point that's not going to happen, you got to rip the bandaid off because it's disruptive to the team. If the other person is going to decide not to be a supportive disappointed competitor, but instead is going to be an undermining disappointed competitor. That needs to be addressed upfront with as much dignity as possible, but it, it needs to be dealt with quickly before team dynamics change. Oh, definitely. If, you know, there's the underminer, you know, there's, you know, a two brute kind of thing. There's the underminer. You got to deal with that right up front. And that I view that pretty much in the same way that I view the response we gave to the other question, what happens if shortly in your tenure, somebody who was your peer violates company policy or bad acts? Well, undermining is a bad act. You don't have to agree with everything, but you can't undermine. So, um, and that, I'd like to, before we go on, hit one question that came up, Tim, and that is if you distance yourself from your peers, who you presumably knew you trusted and you trusted their judgments when you were their peer, do you recommend finding new confidants? Well, there's maybe two parts to that question. The first one maybe is how far do you distance yourself? So it doesn't mean to distance yourself. It doesn't mean that you turn, totally turn your back on somebody who's given you good advice or good guidance before, but Rather, it's recognizing that the relationship has changed. And so there needs to be distance in that regard that the relationship has changed. You're no longer best buddies who, who you know, hang around on Friday afternoon for a couple hours after work. So that, I, I think recognizing what it means to distance, it's not to turn your back on somebody. Right, and uh, some of this also depends upon whether your now subordinate understands and can separate between being a member of your team and being your friend. I've had people who, even though I became their boss, were still and still today are close personal friends. And we did do things together out of work. Our family did do things together. Uh, what I wouldn't do is talk with that person about work stuff that would give her, she, give her um, a competitive advantage, if you will, to my other direct reports, right? So if the person understands how to be a friend and how to separate that, it's easier. There are some people who the line just gets totally blurred. And, hey, Tim, you know, because we were buddies, I'm now going to sit on the, your desk and let's share the gossip. I mean, if I'm one of those people, then Tim has to back away, just has to back away. And we all, 
distance ourselves from friends over time for a variety of reasons. Yeah, so, and the second part of the question was, should I find other confidants? confidants. And such? Yeah, the answer is I never stop searching for them. There is always somebody who can provide me good coaching, uh, I, who can be a good mentor to me, and they don't have to be at the same level of me either. Some of the best coaching I've gotten in organizations have been from administrative assistants. So you find people who can help you with whatever it is that you need to work through. So don't ever stop and always look for new ones. Right. And for those of you who are general counsel, you know that it actually is a really lonely job because you're used to people coming to you for the answers. And if you're unsure as to how to deal with something, it's not as if you can go to one of your peers in the C-suite because they don't have the same skill set that you have. It's, you can't even go to your general counsel buddies on the outside because so often there's confidentiality and privilege attached to it. And you're not going to run to your outside counsel because they don't understand the environment in which you're dealing. So sometimes people go to coaches for that to help them talk through things. But it, it, it's a lonely job. And the higher up you go in certain organizations, the more you're standing on your own. You can't yeah. always find somebody to fill a slot. Coaches can be so effective. Having a formal coaching relationship, it can be so effective to help work through these types of issues because the coach presumably over time, whether it's been months or a longer relationship, they will know you. They'll know some of the people that you work with some of the, the difficult people that you work with where you try to get help from, they'll understand a bit from your company too, and yet they maintain that strong confidentiality and objectivity. So coaches can be a very, very good help in these types of situations. So we've been focusing on all of the challenges for being promoted over your peers. If we go to the next slide, you have advantages in the job by becoming a boss of people who you already know the people, you know the company, you know the issues, you know the competitors. And that's something that actually helps you make the transition because it is, it's a tough transition. And um, you, kn you know who on your team has good, strong insights. Some people have better EQ people skills than others. Some people know, you know, have more substantive expertise. You know that. So you know where, who you can go to and rely upon for certain things. And it's, it's something that if you're hired in as a boss in a new organization, you don't have, you have to learn all of that. You don't know who you can trust. I mean, you'll find that out, but you don't, you don't have any of that knowledge. You've got to be figuring that out at the same time that you're learning the company and you're learning your job. Being a general counsel in one company is not identical to being a general counsel in another company. So, I mean, the Think about the advantages you have and use them, both from a knowledge basis of the, the business and the industry and the company, but also on a, an experience basis with the people. What can yeah. you add, Tim? One of the things that I mentioned was in any relationship, the more you can make the relationship about somebody else, the better off the relationship is going to be, at least received by the other person. And you can use that to your advantage to better the company too, because the, the people, your former peers that are now your subordinates, you know what their strengths are, leverage them. You know what their weaknesses are. Those are called development opportunities, right? right? Help to develop them. Uh, you may know what people's career goals are, or at least it's pretty easy to understand them if you start to ask about them because you'll understand the group that you're in, the smaller group, the bigger group, the company, et cetera. So you can have those types of discussions a little bit more easily. And you know what 
a lot of the past complaints were, a lot of the, the hurdles, whatever it is. So you might be able to more effectively, maybe more quickly help deal with those too. So there's so many advantages to being promoted within, as Marla said, use them, use them to the betterment of your team, use them to the betterment of, of the company. Don't just use them for yourself. All right. If we go to the next slide. So everything we've been talking about thus far has to do with you and your team and developing your, uh, your relationships and your authorities with people who were once your peers. Keep in mind, however, that when you're in a new role, let's say you become general counsel, the people who are your new peers, who are also your clients, may have been people who you were doing work for before, and they're not used to dealing with you as a peer. They're used to dealing with you as a doer. And so look beyond your new team. You are establishing yourself as a leader, but you have a bunch of different audiences. It's not just your subordinates. Maybe you can talk more on this, Tim. Sure. I, the, well, the first thing hopefully that you've developed in order to get into the position you are, whether it's being promoted as a GC or a leader in a law department, is that um, you've developed good executive presence. I said earlier, appearances count. And I don't mean physical appearances. It means how you show up at work. That is very, very important. You have to start doing that right away with your new peers. Another thing we talked about earlier is make it about them. Uh, your, your business peers, even your other functional peers, they don't care about law problems if you're GC. They have business problems, they have an HR problem. It just happens to have a legal component. But you think about that, that you come to them and you serve them, helping them to get over their problems. It just happened to have a legal component. But in their eyes, it's an HR problem. It's a, it's a business problem. Use your expertise to help them solve their problems. That's what I mean by making it about you. A lot of the things that we talked about earlier apply here, like establishing your authority, um, treading lightly, but not too lightly. All of those types of things, all of those bullet points, they apply here too, in this case, uh, just in a slightly different way. Right. And again, it's establishing your, you have credibility, otherwise you wouldn't have gotten the job. You have trust, otherwise they wouldn't have, the CEO would not have asked you to become the general counsel. It's just, you need to teach them how to work with you at a different level, which means then you need to embrace the fact that you are operating at a different level and the things that got you to the GC role will not necessarily make you a successful GC. So you're there not just because you're a really good lawyer, you're there because you're a leader. You, you have to do some you know, group dynamics that may have you step out of your previous legal role into just a leadership role. And you can't just step back and go, well, no, that's a business decision. I'm not part of that. You are part of that because you're the C-suite. Who else owns it other than you? So you just need to keep in mind that while you are establishing your authority with your team, they're going to be looking to see how others at the C-suite are looking at you. How do other people in the organization relate to you? And so that gets us to the last slide, which really is best demonstrated practice. Oh, I can't speak. Best demonstrated practices. Meet with the people on your teams as soon as possible. Treat everybody like a valued employee and clearly establish expectations, roles, and responsibilities. And learn from what you, either are positive and negative mentors, learn from the good and avoid what you've seen others foibles and mistakes have been. And be very consistent in how you work with members of your team, how you give post positive and constructive feedback and acknowledge 
how you depend upon them and their contributions so that it is a team. It's not just you and a bunch of peons. Yeah, and the thing that I'd add, Marla, is that as you said early on, it's lonely at the top, it is. And part of how that translates to me is that the higher you go into an entity, the more and more you are judged solely by your actions, not by your words, not by your intent, not what's in your heart. So it's the, the, the actions that you engage in. So be mindful of that. So it's 2.01, according to my clock, Eastern time. I know we have a few more questions. Bob, what do you want to do here? Um, if you would like, you can uh, continue to ask, answer those questions. Um, sure. Or, or we, you know, we, can, um, we can wrap it up, so. So let's, let's hit on, there's a couple of questions that came in that was really not so much about leading your peers, but just leadership generally, things around delegation and how do you delegate to people and a team who are unwilling to take on more responsibility. I'm already so busy, I can't do anything else. What do you do with regard to that? Or how do you assess your talent pool and whether you have the right people in the right roles? Those are things that apply regardless of whether you're new to a company or whether you've been promoted up into a role. Um, the best way I have found to establish whether you have the right talent doing the right things is to talk to your clients and to figure out what their needs are, not just today, but in future. And then you step back and you assess the people who you have on your team and are they doing the right things? Are, do they have the ability to put the take the garbage off of their shoulders to give them more time to do the more strategic stuff. It's almost starting with a whiteboard with these are the priorities. This is what has to get done. These are the people that we have. This is the time they are spending on doing a variety of things. And what are the things that we don't have to do anymore or needs to be done, but doesn't necessarily have to be done by a lawyer or can we come up with ways to empower our clients to be more self-reliant so they don't have to keep coming back to the legal department and making us a pinch point? Those are good leadership tools. I highly recommend Harvard Business Review because they have so many good articles that help you see how others have dealt with these kind of issues. Um, and the last question that I thought that we could touch on is how do you establish leadership authority credibility with peers who have no respect for legal? Tim, what do you do in that situation? Isn't that everybody outside of legal? Yeah. <laughs> um, no. So the, <laughs> the, uh, the thing to remember is that, especially those of us with, with legal training, we're taught in persuasion. So you have to sell somebody, if you will, or convince them, persuade them as to the proper way to view whatever it is that they don't value. What you are doing, what your team is doing. So think about that. It's how do you persuade them to get there? Because people, if they're, if they're not respecting, not valuing, it's because they don't know to respect you. They don't know to value you. So demonstrate what you can to earn the respect, demonstrate what you can uh, so that they value you. And some of that is teaching people how to use their legal department. Not everybody understands how to do that. So there's an education process. I think hopefully you've picked up that it isn't easy to suddenly be put in charge of people who were your peers and people who may have been your former managers. It's okay to feel overwhelmed with the responsibility, but you're not in it alone, even though it's lonely at the top. 
there are places you can reach out. Number one, you can reach out to others within the company who you've seen do it well and just talk with them as to how they did it and what they think about and why they do what they do. There are obviously outside organizations where people are talking about leadership and management and not so much the substantive legal stuff. And again, I don't want to sound like I'm touting anything. There are coaches that can help you do this. You don't have to invent the wheel. You can work with people who themselves have built a wheel and rolled on a wheel, and they can share that experience with you to make your journey a little easier. So with that, I think, Bob, we're going to kick this over to you to close out the event. Well, Marla and Tim, thanks so much for sharing some very practical information um, for those you know that are either advancing in their career right now in their same organization or have, uh, have aspirations um, because having that type of insight is uh, just so valuable. And for those who are attending, um, you know, if they're, if you're, um, you know, want to explore how we can be of assistance, whether it's helping you build your team, uh, you know, executive coaching, leadership development, succession planning, optimizing your team, um, any of those type of things, feel free to reach out to, to Marla or myself. Um, uh, and we are going to send just a, a one minute survey out to, to um, all attending today. Appreciate you just providing some feedback. That's uh, greatly appreciated. Um, and, and thank you very much for, for joining us today. Uh, and we look forward to having you join us on future GC Advantage webinars. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank have, you have all. Thanks all. Bye. Bye-bye.